Welcome back to Nobunaga's Ambition Abridged. In the previous part, we had a grindy war against the Takeda, which we sort of won. But more importantly, we defeated the Asakura and ended the anti-Nobunaga coalition, so that's got to be a good thing. Now we're focusing on the Takeda again, because with them distracted by a war with the Nagao to the north, our last dregs of an army in the east might be able to push forwards and achieve something. We've now taken Nagashino and we're well on the way to taking Iramura. So with this we can actually start moving into the Takeda's territory and doing something. As mentioned, we won't have that many troops to use for this bit of the campaign, but the Takeda certainly won't either. We have to achieve something strategically here, otherwise all of those gigantic battles will go to waste. At the same time, I've got plenty of troops over on the west side of our domain, so I figured we might as well just do something over here. Let's do another push to get rid of some of the Miyoshi territory on our border. Also the Honganji Ishiyama stronghold there as well would be a nice target. So we're just throwing in absolutely loads of troops. We're going to have an advantage in that we have lots of castles close to the front line, the Miyoshi's castles. Many of them are on Shikoku Island, so they can't reinforce this position very well. So simply spamming our way in will give us an advantage. And of course, that's always the best strategy in any situation here. It's particularly good. Did some maximum micro for this first battle where we auto resolved the guys outside the first castle down to the point of near death and then manually resolved the last couple of hundred troops in order to get that damage against the castle for free. So there you go, that castle is going to be as good as taken, we only need to leave a few troops behind to besiege it. Everyone else can think about moving straight on, half the troops didn't even make it to the front line before the front line was broken open. We have total momentum here. Against the Takeda there is a minor battle outside the castle I'm moving towards here. That's good because now we can do the thing where we easily win the minor battle manually to get some free damage on the castle. In this case we don't need to do it and the battle doesn't even go very well. Looks like I'm trying to charge or something there taking enormous casualties to defeat that small enemy force but there we go. The castle was already pretty weak now it's super weak so we're going to take that place for sure in the very near future. In the west we're doing a twin push towards Arioka and Ishiyama at the same time. We've got plenty of units to do it. We have enough units to do a third push if we really tried somewhere or other. That's all looking good though with the enemy being pushed back. We can just auto resolve them to death. Looks like that siege is coming along nicely. I'm also starting another siege up at Kiso Fukushima. That one's going to be more difficult. It's awkward enough just to get there because of all these small mountain roads. And it's a pretty high level castle actually. Arioka surrenders, so now we're in a great position to attack Ishiyama. Not only do we have its outskirts occupied, but the enemies nearby can now be hit with a big rear attack. And we have enough momentum that I'm going to order troops to go on and attack the next place down to the southwest as well. We're going to sweep the enemy out of this entire section and bring our borders up to the coast. That's a nice comfy place to put them. I'm also going to keep going against the Takeda. We really don't have that much here but the enemy don't have very much at all, even less, so we're going to do some minor fights to try and push forwards and grab at least one more castle up there. Looks like Ishiyama is now going to be in big trouble. It is a major location with tons of hit points, so we have to attack it and sacrifice a bunch of troops to eventually capture it, but that's going to happen. Meanwhile, the remaining battles here are going to be super easy. Our allies are providing support from the sea, and I've got troops going down a back road to rear attack the remaining Miyoshi troops. Overall, we have dominated this region. It's all looking good. I need to constantly micromanage at Ishiyama to try and have big units besieging it so we can get the siege going as soon as possible. I messed it up because I was trying to get units to go home as much as I could to save supplies. And here I've got too many people going back, we need more guys to stay behind and sacrifice themselves at Ishiyama. We do have enough to do it, just need to make sure it's actually organised correctly. On the Takeda front, we've now got two potential sieges going. The Kiso Fukushima one lacks troops, as I said it's a high level castle, it's got tons of hit points. So again we need to do the sacrificial stuff, but we don't have that many troops to sacrifice, plus it takes so long to get there that our units don't have very many supplies, making them unsuitable for doing long sieges. Plus castles do have a resistance to blockade stat, so if they're upgraded in a certain way, the bar will go down really slowly. 
and if it goes down slower than your supplies bar goes down, then you're going to have trouble actually sieging them out. At least in the west, things are absolutely fine. The enemy can't really disrupt our sieges here, we have so many troops that even though they start battles like right there, the siege continues. A nice little mechanical subtlety is that if a battle takes place at a siege location, if the battle isn't very big, the siege isn't broken, which is perfect because if you could break a siege by just sending 10 guys in to disrupt and cause a battle, that would be pretty cheeky. So here's a perfect example actually, a battle kind of stops halfway through and turns into a siege and a battle at the same time so that we're fighting and reducing the castle's morale and I think that's just because the enemy's troop count was too low to sufficiently distract us, something like that. So Ishiyama now falls and we immediately get a quest which presumably is a result of taking this place but it's not related to Ishiyama in particular, I think it might be related to having control of the general Osaka region which was a place where they did a fair bit of international trade. And it's a quest to do with international trade, it's about promoting trade with the Western Kingdoms. We have to capture six trade ports, we'll probably do that at some point, have loads of muskets, we'll have to buy them, and obtain a globe. I think that's just an RNG thing, obtain a globe, because sometimes the merchants will sell random items to you. In this case they don't have any random items, but one day a globe might be for sale, I could buy it and that will satisfy that objective. As for the muskets, we can buy those as well, but to get 10,000 would cost many times my current treasury. So we're going to gradually, when I remember, buy small amounts of muskets every month or something and gradually work our way up towards that 10,000 count, maybe we'll get there eventually. I noticed the Nagao clan are absolutely annihilating the Takeda, it's pretty much over for the Takeda. So obviously I'm immediately thinking, how much of a threat are the Nagao to us? Luckily we still have way more troops than them, and I'm doing some diplomacy which will bring some useful results later on, to avoid conflict with them. And speaking of diplomacy, right there I sent a diplomat to talk to the Emperor. I think if you have 100 trust with the Emperor, who's like an invisible faction in the background, you can force him to stop other factions from attacking you. So it's like an insurance policy, if you're about to be destroyed, you ask the Emperor to force the enemy to go away for a certain period of time, and then you might be fine. At Kise Fukushima, we've lost all of the original units that were doing the siege, well not lost, they went home due to lack of supplies, although many of them are actually dying on the way home due to lack of supplies. Luckily another wave has arrived, and even if you end the siege, the enemy's morale doesn't go all the way back up, so you can kind of pick up where you left off as long as you do the siege quickly as far as I can tell. And in the west, things are peaceful, need to disband my troops and just leave things as they are. We're going to start a new military project now though, because I wanted to attack up north and wipe out the Hongganji forces up there. What I'm trying to do here is work out if there's a way for me to order my troops to just all go and gather at one spot. Someone in the comments had said something about there being a way to make your troops all just go and stand somewhere. But I didn't remember what it was, so I started just wildly clicking around trying to see if I could do it. I eventually then gave up and did it the hard way. We can just deploy the troops that are further away manually, move them up and then start the campaign and we'll have loads of things in that little basin area up north, ready to go and with all of the mountain crossings already out of the way. It's only two castles that we're facing, so we don't really need to send a massive army up here. But they were two good castles, and also I just wanted to send a massive army. The downside to this is it's going to use a bunch of supplies, so this does stop me from sending a massive army somewhere else later, meaning I could be more strategic about this, but I wasn't. Now here's something useful. We've got to 100 trust with the Nagao, which allows us to do an arranged marriage which will set us into permanent alliance. Now that sounds like something that will stop them from attacking us, which would be convenient. So I'm looking through the list of unmarried people we have available in our clan. I clicked a guy and then when I clicked on their list it showed only guys and I thought, oh it actually allows gay marriage in this game, that's pretty progressive. But no, it doesn't, it just gets you to this stage and then says no. So we have to find a girl because they only have guys available, but look, their faction leader is available, so that's a pretty strong political marriage. The goal now is to find the worst possible girl we can send this guy, 
because we're going to lose them as a character, so we want someone with low stats to be lost, and the enemy, our, sorry, our allies, will be gaining them as a character. So again, we want them to have low stats to improve our own relative power. I eventually went with the first person in the list, I think, who was also the only one who's not underage, so that's progressive for you. And off they go, so very soon the Nagao will not be a threat to us, presuming the alliance holds up and works, as I hope. Next I turned my attention back to the west, I wanted to do another push, going southwards to knock out the two enemy castles that are nearby. And here's the big discovery, I discovered you can mass select your units and order them all to go stand at a single point, which solves the whole out of control auto deploy thing. You just had to hold down shift while selecting or something, I had tried to do it before and come to the conclusion that you couldn't because it didn't seem like you could do box selection. Against Honganji, well, things are looking pretty good. Their forces are outnumbered, they're retreating, and they're about to be seriously outflanked as our guys go down that mountain road to appear behind them. Very satisfying. So they're in huge trouble. As mentioned, we don't need this many troops here. A lot of our guys won't actually take part in those fights, but it looks impressive. And Kiso Fukushima has finally fallen after all this time. We're not even going to rest though, I'm going to keep going with more units being brought up from our interior because I want to press the Takeda even harder if I can, due to the fact that the, the Nagao have wiped them out in the north, they'll probably wipe them out in the south if we don't get in there and steal those castles as soon as possible, so we're going to keep going. Here's Hongenji getting really annihilated, if you look closely the numbers of the enemy's casualties in this auto-resolve are extreme, we're trading super well, much better than a manual fight would give us, so that's all good. In this case I do miss the opportunity to do the manual fight outside the castle and get the damage, but with our numbers we don't really need to do that. Soon I've gathered a pile of troops near the Takeda border, so it's time to press in to Kai province, their homeland, and see if we can do anything there. The only issue we have is that none of our armies over there are particularly strong, so it's really a dregs campaign. Our main bulk is up here, having a nice easy time against Hongenji. Their first castle surrenders to us early on, so the second castle's in big trouble. Here's our push against the Saika. We can also use mountain roads here to our advantage, sneaking troops around the back of the enemy's main position while we make our frontal attack. I also considered sending my rearguard troops to attack Awaji Island. I thought maybe I don't need these troops for this push, I could just go do something else. I decided to not do that, but leave them in a position where they can do it, which we'll soon get back to. As for the push itself, it's going to be okay because the troops defending the approaches to this enemy castle are insufficient in number, so we can push through them with our two blobs, and then we'll go and fight at the castle. The only thing that will hold us back, potentially, is supplies. The enemy are making us stand here for a while and many of our units will be stuck in a queue, battle or no battle, wasting their supplies. So if they can hold us up for long enough, we might have another Fukushima situation where we just can't siege them down before we starve to death. Seeing that things were okay, I decided I would actually go for that attack on Awaji Island, so we move out with three units. Luckily, the ships just appear, so we essentially swim out across the sea. That will be fine. While that was happening, here's what I was missing. I didn't even realize a battle was taking place against the Takeda. They deployed to stop us getting down into Kai, and Shingen is owning us up. So this is the downside to the simultaneous turns going on. If I'm microing one front, I'm not microing another front, so we do need to pay a bit more attention. In this case, things aren't looking too good, but we do have a massive number of reinforcements on the way, thanks to Hanbei Takenaka so I was willing to let the grind go on and bring more troops down. Speaking of bringing more troops, we end up with a bit of a situation here with the Saika, because the Miyoshi constantly reinforced their castle by sea, so our troops couldn't press into that location and start the siege. Although the battles themselves are fine, we're just killing the enemy rapidly, it is reducing our supplies and meaning we'll have less and less time to do the castle siege once it starts. Things are going badly in the east, MP3 is playing at the moment, so we need to take another look at what's happening. We've got lots of damaged units, but we do also have those six to 7,000 troops on the way. So with a bit of micro, I'm gonna try and get some of the more dead units to begin walking back. What I was really looking for here, though, was a manual battle. 
because we can avoid the danger of auto-resolving against a high-quality Shingen Takeda by just fighting him, and we do have numbers on our side once my reinforcements arrive. However, as you can see, it does not go very well, because Shingen's high stats allow him to turn the manual battle into a night battle, and we're in serious trouble immediately. We all have this confused status effect, which appears to inflate the casualties we take by like 10 times as the enemy begin their attack. So our first unit is completely annihilated by the advancing enemy. We can't really do anything about that because you can also barely move in confused status. The only thing we have going for us is that confused status goes away after a while. So the sacrifice of that first unit took up a little bit of the enemy's time. Now we can start to line up and get something going. And here's the point when the confusion wears off. So with that out of the way, things aren't so bad anymore. Now it's just a three on three battle where we have double their troop count. So if we just slog at each other, maybe things will be okay. Well, they still weren't that okay because the enemy pressed forwards and we quickly had a melee situation. I decided to embrace the madness and just order everyone to go into the melee, thinking maybe with our big numbers advantage, even if we trade quite poorly, we'll wipe them out quickly and move on. Well, we trade more than quite poorly. We lose virtually everything. We do just about win, but we lost well over 10,000 troops in that battle. And as you might have noted, a lack of troops on this front is our main problem. So we've gained victory there and given ourselves access to Kai province, but now we have so few troops, can we get through the next set of units defending the castles or take the castles themselves? You might think this is yet another opportunity to stop attacking the Takeda, which we've had quite a few of so far. And at first I thought maybe this is the one, maybe this is the time I retreat. But then I thought, no, it's not going to be that time. We have to keep doubling down, throwing good money after bad. We're going to scrape the barrel some more. We're going to get the troops that were already retreating and turn them around and send them back into the grinder. We're going to send everything, which isn't very much, in the area and try and just somehow tip the Takeda over the edge before anyone else does. We obviously don't really need to be doing this, but it's partially just for entertainment purposes. In the West, you can see more and more troops being piled into that battle by the Miyoshi. The fact we haven't gone and besieged the area by sea is really biting us there. At least up north, the campaign against Hongenji is going absolutely fine because we have overwhelming power. If we'd moved those troops somewhere else, the other fronts might be a little bit better, of course. But at least that one's sorted out. We even capture their faction leader, Hongenji Kenyo, who is a pretty high stats character. Because of that, I decided to execute him just in case he ended up going to one of the other factions. I figured if we release him, he probably won't feel any debt to us because he's not even a samurai. Better just kill him now and get this whole thing over with. We'll probably be killing virtually all of his followers in a law sort of sense, although that's not represented in the game. They're going downtown and that's all fine. As our last wisps of an army push into Kai, we face the last wisps of the Takeda army. And here we can take advantage of a mechanic I've learned earlier in the game at some point. That being when the enemy are using tribal troops, like in this castle defense, the tribal troops don't count towards the victory conditions. In other words, if we kill their regular unit, we don't have to fight the tribal unit and the tribal units in the corner, meaning it will take them a while to get to the fight. So if we focus down the enemy and kill them really fast, we might not have to deal with them at all. And here's a perfect chance to use wildly rushing into melee. I'd noted before, I thought maybe it was a good idea if you were under time pressure because otherwise it always seems to go quite badly. Well, here we are under time pressure. If we can defeat the enemy super fast, we'll avoid taking extra casualties. So maybe it's worth taking the extra casualties right here in the melee. We can use defense and attack buffs to help out. And very soon we've won that tiny fight against that tiny unit. Plus we can now damage the castle as well. So with that, it looks like we are set up to take this minor castle, although another unit is deployed from it just before I arrive. So we still have to essentially do the same battle again. Good news is rolling in from elsewhere, but we need to focus on this right now. We need maximum micro. The enemy redeploy their tribal unit. So we go down and essentially do the battle I just did again. 
This time my leading unit doesn't have many troops, so while I'm trying to wipe the enemy out without waiting for my reinforcements to catch up, it's not going to go quite so well. I again pop off the buff to try and survive. We've got fewer number than them though, so even with the buffs, it's not going to be quite enough to tip them over the edge. So we lose one unit, the enemy have fewer than 100 troops left, so all we have to do is touch them really, and that will end the fight. Eventually, somebody comes over, does the requisite touching, and there we have it, victory. This time we aren't allowed to destroy the castle, maybe because it's already so destroyed after the previous battle. But there we have it, loads of just about alive guys stumble forwards to this Takata castle, and because it's in bad condition, we may actually be able to take it. In the west, we finally got somebody at Saika Castle, but you can see plenty of my units already falling back because they didn't have the supplies and I ordered them off the fight. More will just be sent in though, we can redeploy from our other castles and try to close that one out. We took Somoto there with no resistance, they just surrendered the, the moment my troops arrived. So we've still got plenty of troops on Awaji, and I thought maybe we should think about just going on to the west and attacking Shikoku Island. It's going to be a very extended position that we can't reinforce easily. It's also one I don't really want to take, but I thought let's just be as aggressive as possible because that's usually the most entertaining and in some cases the best way to play a strategy game. We'll end this part with a bit of good luck. As our troops arrive at this castle, it surrenders pretty much right away, so we don't even have to siege it down. Absolutely ideal, because the Takada did actually have several thousand troops at that other castle across the road. So if we had to stand here besieging them, they might have come over and just killed us. So this is good. Now we have a base here. We can get more supplies. We can put a few troops inside the castle and deploy the castle's own troops for an extra thousand or so men at our Takada battlefront. You might think that we're finally done pushing with this tiny force. And of course, you would be wrong. There are still two more Takata castles to take and we need to defeat Shingen and his remaining troops. And we are not going to send any substantial force to do it for no particular reason. So join me to see how that goes in the next part.